uh, to coming. Uh, I will invite start now uh, the Relac uh, Fox Project uh, workshop, Brazilian workshop. Uh, I invite uh, opening and welcome uh, Professor Vinícius Rodrigues Vieira, uh, Instituto de Relações Internacionais, da USP. Uh, Barbara Gobel, of uh, Ibero-American Institute of Berlin. Uh, Professor Guilherme Ariplonski of the uh, Institute de Estudos Avançados of USP. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to our seminar. I'm here representing Iri Uspi. I'm a visiting professor here in the field of international political economy. And when looking at the program of the seminar, I was very glad that we are going to talk about uh, CELAC EU relations, particularly because in the field of international relations, well, this institute studies international relations under a political economic standpoint, we usually think about the relationships between EU and Latin America more focus on Mercosur. It's the main focus because we perhaps think too much under an economic standpoint. Therefore, I think it's a great opportunity not to explore only the political dimension and the impact of uh, CELOC and how it may improve our relationship with the EU, but also to analyze the prospects of potential academic partnerships uh, that are mediated uh, between those two institutions or involving, to be more precise, countries that belong to those uh, institutions. So without further ado, I'd like to give the word to um, Barbara, who we appreciate very much. Her presence has just arrived from Germany here and uh, Professor Ponsky from EIA and our Institute for Advanced Study. And also, it's a nice coincidence to have you here as a former student of USP during my undergraduate years. It was my first job at EIA. So um, it's a nice pleasure, uh, a nice thing to be part of this uh, table uh, with Professor Ponsky. So who'd like to start? I think based on the program, uh, we go to Barbara, after to Professor Ponsky, uh, and afterwards, uh, Barbara will focus, we'll talk about the EU LAC focus project, and then we'll have the keynote speaker. Um, we announce you later to come here, Professor Paulo Roberto Feldman from uh, the School of Economics and Business Affair USPI, who is going to talk about um, the Central Europe and Latin America, two very similar regions that should complement much more. Afterwards, we will be delighted to have a speech by Dr. Paulo Sequeira from uh, CNPQ, our National Council for Research on the Potentials and Challenges of eu select Relations, and we'll close with a discussion by uh, Barbara, uh, Professor Paulo Feldman, and Dr. Paulo Sequeira, and have more coffee upstairs. Too much coffee, perhaps, in the afternoon, but it's nice to remain awake, particularly if you are jet lagged. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much for coming, and let's start. 
thank you very much, Vinicius. Um, I have to apologize, but we cannot um, have this um, event today in Portuguese, not only because I'm jet lagged, I speak Spanish, but in, in Portuñol, and we could speak in German as we just have. Uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you, and thank you. My special thanks to the organizers, Cecilia Matsumara, also Mosi Martucci, uh, both are participating in the European um, project, um, Eulac Focus, and uh, we thought it would be a nice idea to take advantage of my presence here. I uh, will be here the next day in Sao Paulo um, for a workshop um, together with USPI and SEBRAP and uh, three German institutions, a Center for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences will be built up in Sao Paulo. Uh, this corresponds to an internationalization strategy of the German Federal German Ministry for Research and Education. And I'm all mentioning this because if we're talking about um, a, a European, Latin American, Caribbean relations, science is always there. Science is Wissenschaften, as you say in German. That means um, uh, we also um, are talking about um, knowledge flows and exchanges. Um, I'm social anthropologist by training. Um, you might have thought, what is this? It's what a strange institution, Ibero-American um, Institute. Um, that is a non-university research institution that was founded in 1930 as a bridging institution. Um, it hosts uh, the second largest library on Latin American in the Caribbean in, in the world. Um, it's particularly important if you want to do comparative work. Um, and because uh, information infrastructures are still very much nationally organized in Latin America and the Caribbean, and um, um, it also is a research center and a cultural center. Um, we, our day-to-day -day business is to put Latin America and the Caribbean um, on the stage for German society or society in Germany. And um, uh, this is also a lens to look how difficult it is to position Latin American and the Caribbean uh, because um, there's not a lack of um, interest is uh, from the decision maker point of view often as we sense it the lack of information uh, so Latin America and the Caribbean are there but they have no strategic role not only in Germany but also in many other countries and in the discussion if you want I can also tell you a little bit about the situation of Latin American studies as a bridging um, area of knowledge between Latin America and Europe at the moment in the European Union. Um, so um, that's only for introducing shortly my in uh, the institute. I'm the director of, um, and um, thank you again. And now I would like um, to give the micro over to Ari, who. <laughs> Good. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much to, I think, Professor Moasir and to Cecilia for inviting me. It's a, an enormous pleasure to be here at the Institute, uh, International Res uh, Relations Institute. And uh, uh, not to uh, say that I'm only saying it because it's part of a uh, uh, diplomatic uh, way of saying that I, it's a pleasure to be here. But I'm for the second time, we just finished. Uh, a program, a graduate program that we have in English in the business school together with Professor Alberto Pfeiffer, uh, who uh, was a visiting professor here and still uh, involved in Gacinti, which is a, a group for an, uh, 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 conjuntura, I don't know what con conjuncture, I don't know if it's in English, but uh, international conju uh, conjuncture. But uh, uh, as a subject of, of, of this course is exactly what uh, dear Barbara Goebbels that I just now met and I feel already that we are kind of acquainted for some months at least. But it is science, technology and innovation, the international dimension. So I think we will have also some issues uh, to, to exchange about that, but that's not the subject of, of this specific, uh, my specific uh, remarks here. Uh, I, I would like to make uh, two types of, of, of remarks. 
uh, uh, one is uh, what has the institute of, uh, has done studies to do with with uh, let's say uh, Europe, Latin America, uh, uh, and Caribbean, uh, and I, I would say that uh, two things happen. Obviously, uh, the first one is that we are part of uh, an organization which is international, but it is headquartered and was created in Germany, in, in, in Freiburg, uh, which is uh, UBIAS, University-Based Institute of Advanced Studies. With, uh, and uh, so now the coordination is with uh, uh, a colleague from Denmark, from Aarhus, and uh, a colleague from Freiburg is still the deputy coordinator, and myself, our institute here is also the other deputy coordinator, and we will have in March is a meeting of the directors here in Sao Paulo. So this, uh, and I have uh, been present at, uh, at uh, some of the meetings. The last meeting was, I have some difficulty of saying in Europe, but it was in the UK. So let's say it was still Europe at the time. There was a day, one day before the, the Brexit, so it was still Europe. And uh, so I think this is a, a very concrete uh, connection that we can explore. And here in Latin America, uh, I think we can also have an, uh, an ex uh, uh, maybe an opportunity uh, because, uh, number one, uh, obviously we'll have a lot of institutions uh, of advanced studies or similar uh, present at, at this uh, meeting here, but uh, mainly because we have connections with uh, a new one which is in Costa Rica. Costa Rica there is uh, in Espacio de Estudios Avanzados, and with the Colegio de México, that in spite of not being formally an Institute of Advanced Studies uh, connected to the university, it is uh, the whole institution is an Institute of Advanced Studies. So I think we could explore uh, at some point also the role of the institute in this uh, connection which is being established. And the second and very short uh, remark it has to do with uh, um, uh, with uh, what I saw are the objective of the sp specific meeting, and uh, Barbara reinforced it, that it is how we can present not uh, the whole Latin America and and Caribbean to to European Union, but specifically uh, 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 Brazil in this case, Brazil in a in a I would say a challenging transition to say the least, uh, and. Uh, I, I would uh, just mention that um, uh, maybe one aspect is to uh, have a, a, a joint, uh, uh, an, a, a, let's say, uh, a picture showing uh, what already is happening in these areas, higher education, science, technology, innovation, uh, would be very interesting because there are a lot of things happening, but they're al always very specific. Uh, not to mention from our university, but just uh, because it would be easy. But just to mention, for instance, that I know, if you go to Santa Catarina Florianópolis, the Federal University of Santa Catarina has uh, an historic relation with, with, uh, with Germany specifically, not even saying the whole EU, uh, on this area, higher education, science, technology, innovation. Aachen began with Aachen, etc. So if we have kind of... Uh, a, a space where all this could be uh, 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 present and could be explored, looking at the future to Horizon 2020 and other opportunities, I think this would help uh, uh, not to reinvent the wheel every time we begin something new. So again, thank you very much. Uh, you'll be in wonderful hands with my dear colleague, Professor Paulo Feldman, who is uh, a, a cosmopolitan thinking person and uh, then also with CNPq, which has a long-standing tradition of international cooperation. So uh, thank you very much again for inviting me. Okay, I have now the task to present shortly, briefly, uh, the OLAC Focus project. I will not do this in a traditional way as a dog and pony show and show some interesting slides. I would like to do it in a more reflective mode of why um, I think, and um, not only as a researcher, but also as a director of an institution, that it is an interesting experience to be part of an European Union project. Because if you 
um, talk to researchers, many say, oh, that's a lot of bureaucracy. Yes, there is a lot of bureaucracy. But it's also a learning space because internationalization that does not happen in itself. You have to invest in international relations and therefore you need also experience in um, how to um, manage and administer these type of projects. So um, let us start maybe... Uh, whoop. I know I have a difficulty <laughs> because I'm <laughs> I don't have eyes. <laughs> Maybe to coordinate to, uh, or I just stand because I think we can um, we can. Why I think this is the right time? We should have ten or six. Okay, and I don't. So we have to. Um, yeah. Uh, because uh, maybe I should start um, um, uh, why we think that this is an interesting project. It's a challenging one because uh, the departing point of the project is that uh, uh, relations between European Union and CELAC, and if you mention European Union and CELAC, you immediately see that there is a symmetry because in spite of all the difficulties, European Union is an established mechanism from a legal, political, financial, etc., etc. point of view. And CELAC is like a forum for, of relations. So um, we, uh, uh, the starting point is um, the statement that in spite of having this long-term tradition of relations between Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, um, we, these um, relations are getting more and more fragmented. There was an enthusiasm with the summits and starting with the Rio group and, and later 1999. Uh, but uh, there is a fragmentation of political spaces and institutions as well as diverse and even divergent interests. At the same time, if you look at the scientific dimension, we see that a lot of things are happening. But I'm talking here more on a political dimension. And one of the interesting things of these, this project is that it is not a research project, it's not an ERC grant. It's not a research project in a more traditional way. It's more a science policy type of input we have to deliver, and this is challenging. And in order to regain um, a more focused, a more strategic uh, um, uh, how to say, um, dynamic in the relation. Um, uh, uh, the the OILAC focus project wants to make a contribution to that in order uh, to give an advice in the sense of vision building and uh, giving focus to the relation to the um, stakeholder. Of course, this was before Trump time. Um, and now it's getting more and more urgent uh, to rethink that relation between Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean because the classic tr uh, Atlantic Triangle is now um, not broken but getting more and more uncertain. And um, so the main objective of the project is to give focus to CELAC relations. Um, if you look at the consortium, this is, and this is typical for European Union projects, it's a consortium of many. Most of them have not been working, co-working together. Maybe you can show this slide and the next slide, Cecilia, and then we step back. So the interesting thing is of a project of that dimension, it's only three and a half years, started in March 2016, will finish... Um, um, in in um, um, August um, 2019, that's not too much. Um, the challenge is um, how to negotiate co-working with so diverse institutions that are not having many face-to-face -face relations. Face-to-face -face relations are still very important for international relations because they allow you to build trust. Um, interesting for me, for us, is the heterogeneity of the institutions. Because beyond the classical academic institution, university or non-university research institution, there are funding agencies. For example, the Argentinian Ministry for Science and Technological Innovation, MINSIT, but also the 
uh, international um, branch of the German DLR, which is like an agency for the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research. Um, they are somehow bridging institution between science and policy like the OEI, Organización de Estados Iberoamericanos para la Educación, la Ciencia y la Cultura. Uh, there are um, more scientific NGOs like the Centrum für Soziale Innovation. And if we go now to the next slide, um, also um, the first one, like networks of universities. So that heterogeneity is one of the advantages of the project and at the same time one of the challenges because there's no one logic. It's a polylogic experience and you have to handle that. You have to make a productive to make it productive. The main coordination is the Universidad de Barcelona and um, all the administration that's also common in European Union projects is in the hand of an um, yeah, how to say managing enterprise for projects. Um, this is at the moment the only project in the social sciences and humanities between European Union and Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's the one that has been chosen out of 38. So, so maybe we still wait, wait um, one back, uh, maybe it's um, uh, not too. Um, and um, so there is a also um, great pressure somehow that you have to deliver. Um, and we have in the format in itself an inbuilt asymmetry. You know, uh, those who pay the bill define the agenda and the formats. So European Commission is paying here. Uh, that means, for example, that Brazil and Mexico or the institutions as USP um, uh, located in Brazil or in Mexico cannot receive funds. And this is the reason why we have already there an inbuilt asymmetry. But it's also an asymmetry because the main language is English. Everything has to be delivered in English. And uh, we are not really taking advantage of the fact that Latin America, may, maybe not so much Carib uh, the Caribbean, but Latin America is the largest, um, not monolinguistic, but uh, bilinguistic area for science in the world. It's the only region in the world where we have so few languages. And that is an advantage. And we are not really... Um, taking advantage of that because the formalities allow us not to do so. So we have also a lot of discussions within the project about asymmetries in, um, in uh, uh, knowledge structures, in institutional landscapes, funding mechanism, etc. For example, the Caribbean, a quite fragmented area uh, that is always there and never has an agency. Um, and it's really great for us that um, the University of West Indies, which is 18 countries in the Caribbean, um, are there. Because they're always reminding us, don't forget about the Caribbean. Normally the relations between Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean on the um, bilateral but also on the bi-regional level are concentrating on four countries in Latin America, as you know, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, and um, since a couple of years, um, also Peru and Colombia. And it's all about co-financing, as you all know. And those who cannot, as for example uh, Bolivia, are then out of the Caribbean. So that is um, the next point I want to make, that these projects are also spaces of experience, of learning, they're le learning spaces not only how to work together and co-produce knowledge, but also how to organize this, how to make out of an asymmetry, asymmetric format a less asymmetric relation. And um, I really appreciate all these experiences. Um, the next interesting point of the project is that, as um, already was stated, Normally we look um, from the science policy standpoint 
at the relations between European Union and CELAC um, from the, uh, through the lens of economy. Uh, and this project tries, and this is the next slide, to connect uh, three dimensions that normally are not taken into account, or if they are taken into account, are analyzed in parallel tracks and not connected. Um, the scientific, the social, and the cultural dimension. And of course, economy is always there. As we would say in the social sciences, it's the subtext. But it's, there's no specific um, focus, neither on the economic nor the political dimension. These are the contexts. So I think this is interesting, but it's also challenging. Because if you look at the bi-regional uh, bi -regional relations, you will see that they are much more established in the scientific dimension. We have mechanisms like YIRI, for example. Um, if you look at the social dimension, um, it's uh, not so much about joint programs, it's about mitigating, for example, migration, uh, uh, citizen rights, etc. If you look at Eurosocial, and if you look at the cultural dimension, it's quite fragmented. We don't have, um, well, we have in um, some uh, Mercosur Digital, for example, would be an example. In some areas, uh, we have uh, uh, programs and established relations, but it's uh, still cultural dimensions um, develop still more or less on the binational level. Um, so we have three thematic um, pillars, and if we go to the next slide, um, <coughs> we have two cross-cutting. Um, we have two cross-cutting uh, work packages. You know, in the language of the European Union project, it's all about milestones, work packages, deliverables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> um, we call that in German Projektsprech. No how to, uh, the language of the projects. So the next one. And we have two cross-cutting. Work package two, the cross-cutting topics. This is where we collaborate um, very closely. It's co coordinated by the Ibero-American Institute and by USPI. Um, it's Mossi Martucci and me. And the vision building process. Um, the idea of the cross-cutting topics is to bind together, to interlink the thematic silos, but also to give an input to the vision building. Um, and uh, what, how are we doing all this? And um, that's the next slide. Um, we have workshops, quite few. This is the only face-to-face -face interrelation uh, relation we have. We have meetings, uh, communication quite a lot, and public events to give some outreach. And the products um, are on the one hand uh, repositories of documents, synthesis paper, scientific publications, and policy paper. So if you look at this, this is quite classical. Um, and if you look at the products, uh, they're quite dispar or diverse. This is also normal for European Union projects. Um, if you look at the success rate of European Union projects, this is so low, specifically in the area of social sciences, um, that they're not built off in a very inter integrative way. Uh, and then when you get the project, you have to think what to make out, <laughs> how, to <laughs> how to put into a reality all these um, um, things. Uh, but again, uh, already now, after one year, we see a lot of side effects. We are working closely together with the OLAC Foundation, based in Hamburg, um, and we are trying to use this as a space for connecting. And now I want to finish with, I think it's the last slide, because you might ask yourself, what are we doing in Work Package 2? Maybe, I think it's the next one. If not, the following one. Uh, Cecilia, no, the next one, maybe it's easier. Prossimo. Okay. Yeah, we decided on four cross-cutting uh, topics. Uh, which are um, also, um, if you go to the summit documents of strategic relevance, mobility, inequality, diversity, and sustainability. 
and uh, the next slide, uh, we are analyzing them as connecting the thematic um, silos, but also, and this is the last slide, looking at the interlinkages. Uh, so one of the um, lessons we learned already that less is more in so heterogeneous projects, so we wanted to focus on cross-cutting topics that allow us to um, capture some of the specificities of uh, the relations between European Union and CELAC. Um, I will finish now in order not to take more time because I think my 10 minutes are already over, so I'm sorry for that. And if you have any other more detailed questions, I'm later here also in the coffee, so you can ask and maybe we can pick up some of the um, results also in the final discussion. So thank you. Um, so, continuing our program, I'd like to invite, to thank Barbara, of course, but now to invite Professor Paolo Roberto Feldman to deliver his keynote speech on Central Europe and Latin America. So, please take your seat here. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Vinicius. Thank you, Cecilia. And please give my thanks to Professor Moisier for the invitation. It's uh, an honor for me to be here. And uh, <coughs> well, considering this giving focus, I will follow this. <coughs> what my intention is to show that we, Latin Americans, we need to give focus to Central Europe. Europe is really too much important, but for us, especially Central Europe, is the great opportunity. So that's my objective with my presentation. <coughs> Look, this is Central Europe. I think that everybody knows. Uh, they, they, uh, they have around 17 different countries. The most important are Poland, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. I will talk a little bit about them later. And uh, they have very homogeneous characteristics. Even after the end of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. So uh, interesting because uh, this block, the Central Eastern Europe, they, uh, it's a kind of an artificial block that was created because of the period of the communism. But their characteristics remain the same and they are very integrated even after the end of the communism. With respect to Latin America and, as Barbara mentioned, Caribbean, we can't forget Caribbean, <coughs> we have around 33 countries in our region, but majority of them are very small countries, the blue ones, Half of them, they have m less than four million inhabitants. Well, my intention here is to show you that there are many similarities between Central Europe and Latin American Caribbean. And we need to take advantage of these similarities and also watch to the opportunities that are huge. So, starting, why these two regions uh, have so weak relations? Why, 
how can we explain why we have so weak relations? And so the explanation, it's very easy. Well, we have a lack of mutual understanding between us. There is the language. It's a great barrier, uh, especially Hungarian. You know? And the distance, the geographical distance, which is really uh, a large, a large distance, but also uh, the lack of infrastructure in some of the capitals of the Central Europe countries and Latin American countries. The next one, Cecilia. But what we have in common, we have in common that we left tough dictatorships very recently, and in the same period, the 80s and the 90s. So we were very tough dictatorships. In Latin America, the military, uh, many military cups, and in Central Europe because of the communism and because of the influence of the Soviet Union. But beginning in the 90s, both regions, in the 80s, both regions started to be democracies. As a consequence, uh, we have a lack, we, when I say we, I'm saying both regions, we feel a lack of democratic tradition, and in fact, when we compare us to other regions in the world, especially the rest of Europe, the Western Europe, we don't have a strong civil society. What else we have in common? Well, the transition for democracy was very difficult in both regions. We have uh, economic underdevelopment. We have faced a very tough foreign crisis, foreign debt crisis. And we suffer in both regions with our privatization. Many, many problems in our privatization problems, especially in Brazil, for example, in, in some other countries of Latin America, but also in Central Europe. Another common aspect, very interesting, both regions had a very good period, a very nice period in terms of uh, growth during the beginning of this century, be especially between the year 2000 and 2008, Central Europe entered the European community, which was something excellent for them, and Latin America had the commodities boom. Uh, I will mention some authors that have studied the, the relation between Central Europe and Latin America along the years. And there are some people, especially in Poland, who has a great experience in Latin America, and they have published many articles, many books. And the one of them is Jadwiga Istanzinski, that wrote The Past as a Future. And she mentioned that the two regions have in common the Catholicism, the populist orientation, and the corporatist feeling. So instead, of thinking in the country, normally people think in their own interests, in the interest of their specific growth, something very typical, in, especially in Brazil. Uh, another important author, it's uh, Polish too, Edmund Urbanski. He is a Latin Americanist, a Polish Latin Americanist. And he mentioned some very interesting aspects about the relation between the people of Central Europe and Latin America. And we are very emotional, like that, in both regions. 
We are contemplatives, enigmatics. We are always waiting for our caudillo to solve our problems. And we are passive. We have a strong passivity when confronting dangers. So uh, five uh, characteristics of our uh, role, of our profile. Historical relations between the two regions. What are the relations from the historic uh, point of view? Well, the first migration from Central Europe to uh, Latin America started in the century 19, uh, especially from Poland and Hungary. During the interwar period between 1980 and 1939, many diplomatic representations were established. And after the Second World War, the Latin American countries positioned in the Western Bloc and Central Europe uh, stay in, this, uh, in the side of Soviet Union. So these are three important historical points that explain many aspects that I will talk uh, later. Uh, no, no, come back, please. Uh, <coughs> for example, the migration started in the century 19, but during that period of the interwar period, there was also a large uh, quantity of migrants from that region, especially my father and my mother, who came, my father from Hungary and my mother from Romania. Uh, in, after the Second World War, during the Cold War, really there was uh, some problems in their relation because we were, we Latin Americans, we were influenced and in a certain way commanded by US. And so US uh, forbidden us, forbade us of having relations with the uh, Central Europe countries and Soviet Union. So uh, this uh, is a Im very important factor. The great diaspora, this is also something interesting about the, the migration. The Polish community in Brazil is really huge, especially in the south of Brazil, in Paraná. But we have one million people uh, that are Polish descendant in Brazil, one million. 600,000 in Argentina and 80,000 uh, in Mexico. The Hungarian community is also a big community and we have more than 100,000 Hungarian descendants in Brazil. The majority of them are in Sao Paulo, 80,000 in Sao Paulo, and 50,000 Hungarians descendants in Argentina. Interesting that even our president Dilma is a Bulgarian descendant, and President Juscelino Kubitschek is a Czech descendant. So, uh, big influence, even in our politicians. No. Uh, well, during the period of, uh, between the wars, we started our economic relations with uh, Central Europe. And uh, these relations, they were characterized by the fact that Czechoslovakia, Hungary and Poland, especially the three countries, they exported metal mechanical products for us, especially for Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. So we bought a lot of machines and metal mechanic products from these three countries. And we exported raw materials. We, uh, we, uh, be, we, wa we were one of the most important exporters of raw materials for them in that period. During the Cold War, well, some problems during the Cold War. A great approximation between Cuba, Cuba and S Central Europe. 
So this was the most important fact during the period of the Cold War because the only country that had relations with Central Europe in that period was Cuba. The others, as I mentioned before, they, the others were, they were, uh, they were forbidden to have relations with S Central Europe. And so there was a big relation on the commercial uh, activities during that period. But, uh, the next please. But after the collapse of the communism, something changed. No, a lot of aspects changed after the collapse of the communism. Uh, there were some cultural influence, very important, because the left parties, they started to reflect about what happened to the Soviet Union. So there was a, a, a great reflection from the left parties, and they involved to an anti-American dependency, anti-American posture, to a reevaluation of democratic ideas. So a change on the position of the left parties. And the left parties decided to participate in the real democratic institutions of these countries. And uh, so this was a, a big modification for the left in Latin America. So the, the left parties they reduce their influence and they change their position completely. Well, <coughs> talking about economics now. The main economic data. Central Europe has 17 countries. Their GDP is almost the same as Brazil. Three trillion dollars is the GDP of Brazil, uh, considering PPP. They have 124 million inhabitants, so total Central Europe has less inhabitants than Brazil. And their GDP per capita is around $22,000. Latin America and Caribbean, 33 countries. GDP. 9.6 trillion dollars, total population 635 million people, so in terms of population we are five times more than Central Europe, but our GDP is only three times more, so that's a reason why the GDP per capita is uh, Fourteen, fifteen thousand no? dollars. Uh, we divide a bigger GDP for a really much bigger uh, number of inhabitants. But in terms of trade, the total exportation of Central Europe is six hundred eighty-seven billion dollars. So. Central Europe export less than Latin American that export almost 900 million dollars. The same as imports, Central Europe 700 and uh, Latin America total imports are around 900. So uh, not so different, but Latin America as a whole has a, a bigger participation in world trade. Now, let's look to the most five most important countries in each region. So, in case of Central Europe, the five most important countries are Re Czech Republic, that I will call Czechia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. And in case of Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and, and Mexico. Here we have something very interesting because all of these five countries in each one of these regions 
they have almost the same participation in the total of their respective region. For example, in the case of Central Europe, that five countries, they have 76% of the total GDP of the region. In the case of Latin America, 77%. In participation of population, it's almost the same. 69 in the case of Central Europe, 70% in the case of Latin America. Participation in total exportations, the same, almost the same percentage. 80% in Central Europe, 79% in Latin America, and uh, uh, importations, 76, 74. Well, what I want to show you is that these five countries in Latin America and in Central Europe are really the most important countries. So uh, my opinion is that we need to focus in these four count five countries. Uh, when I say we, now I'm saying we Latin Americans. So when we look to Central Europe, we Latin Americans, we need to look for these five countries which are the most important countries. Uh, well, and there is another aspect that is very important. Why we need to focus on Central Europe? When we look to Europe, relations with Europe are very important for us. I think that Europe is one of the most important regions for Latin America now, most important than Asia, most important than United States, because we have many cultural uh, proximity with them, with the Europeans, uh, especially with some countries like Spain and Portugal, but also because uh, we have many social characteristics very important and very close to us, but especially from Central Europe. And that, that, this is what I uh, intend to mention. Western Europe is a little bit far from Latin America in terms of social indexes, but not Central Europe. So please, look, for example, for this table with the income per capita of these that 10 countries that I mentioned before. In terms of income per capita, Czech Republic is the highest uh, income per capita, is around $33,000. Uh, in this list, you have Chile in the fifth position, Argentina, Mexico, uh, Look, there are some differences, but they are not so different as if we considered Western Europe. If we consider, for example, Germany, Netherlands, uh, even France, Spain, the income per capita of these Western countries, they are around fifty to $60,000. So totally different from us. If you go to another data, uh, Cecilia, please, the next, the Human Development Index. Also, we have some proximity. Uh, Chile, for example, is better than other many Central Europe countries, even in Slovakia, Hungary, even Argentina is ahead of Romania. So from the point of view of the Human Development Index, we are also very close regions, very close and very similar, please. So talking about market and trade, what I consider important is that we in really, we, if we look to the Western European, so please uh, look into the Western European now, no, not for the Central Europe. We export especially agriculture products. This is our uh, most important products in terms of exportation, especially sugar cane, bananas, tropical fruit, cocoa, soya, beef, farm animals and leather. But in this case of these products, we don't compete with Central Europe. So Central Europe is not a competitor of 
Latin America when exporting to Western Europe. This is a ve very important fact. So what we export is not the same as is exported by Central Europe. Only wheat. Wheat is the only exception, because wheat is an important product, especially from Poland. And we export wheat, too. But except wheat, in the other case of agriculture problem, products, there is no competition. Trade in recent years. What's happening in these recent years? From Latin America to Central Europe. Raw material, agriculture, and mining with little value added. Our products, they have very small value added. From Central Europe to Latin America, manufactured goods with high added value. This is a big, important difference. So our products, they don't have value added, and the Central European, they have a lot of value added. What are the exceptions? The only exceptions of the exportation of Latin America. Mexico, because Mexico is port, car parts, electrical components, metal mechanics and electronics for Central Europe. And Brazil export aircrafts. It's the only manufactured products that Brazil export to Central Europe is uh, aircrafts because of Embraer. Let's look to the most important characteristics of these five important countries of Central Europe. Czech Republic, they are an important manufacturer of cars and vehicles. They have a company called the Skoda, which is one of the largest in the world. And they have a strong tourism too. Hungary, they have a very high capacity of machines, or manufactured machines, and they have a high level of R&D. Poland, very rich in terms of natural resource, as us, as Latin America, but they have a very diversified manufacture. It's, this is something very important of Poland. They manufacture many different products. They have also a strong banking sector. Romania, they are an important exporter of textiles and chemicals and pharmaceutical products. And they have a very cheap labor cost in Romania, one of the cheapest in Europe. Slovakia. Slovakia uh, is the only country of, that re of this region that uses euro as a currency. So the others are not in euro yet. But uh, Slovakia is an euro from in the eurozone. They have a very strong electrical engineering sector. And labor has a very high level and uh, is a, a, a cheap labor, too. So considering everything, what has recently changed? Well, now Central Europe has a great access to Western Europe. So this is something very important for them. But there is a big opportunity for us with the creation of the euro CELAC. Because this will contribute to reduce the to contribute to, to stimulate and to improve the relation between Latin America and Caribbean and Europe and will contribute to reduce the, the mutual ignorance between us. But also we have the possibility of of the establishment of a, a, a zone of a, a, a zone of commerce, of a trade zone between Europe and Latin America. So this could be something very important for our exportations. And uh, so, it, uh, as I mentioned before, this is one of the most important regions of the world for us. And uh, if we have a trade zone, the relation will improve a lot and this could be excellent for all the regions. But what I think is that we need to focus on Central Europe. They are more close to us. They are not so far as some Western Europe. And so 
why does Central Europe could be important partner for, uh, for Latin America? Well, because of the proximity in terms of income, something important that I forgot to mention is that the Central Europe countries, their income per capita is 55% of the average of Western Europe. So approximately half of the income cap so uh, of the income capita of Western Europe. So Western Europe has a really a different income capita, income per capita when compared to us. We have a very complementarity in terms of economy. Uh, we need their machines and they need our commodities, our agri agricultural problems. And uh, the markets to be explored in Central Europe are not so, there are not so competition as in the rest of Europe. So it's another important point for us, for Latin America. And finally, how we can contribute, uh, uh, how we academics, how we universities. I think that our most important contribution should be partnering, having partnership with Central Europe universities. Uh, I think this could be a great point aspect for approximate both regions. They have very good universities in all of their countries. Uh, and so I think that uh, for us academics would be something very interesting to have better relation with their universities. So in a very rapid way, uh, I, s I hope to have transmitted to you uh, what I think about this relation between these two regions. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Professor Paulo Feldman, for your keynote speech. Um, unless you have any questions, comments to make, no. Uh, yeah. But even in European Union, we do not know very much about um, Eastern uh, Europe. Um, of course, we have a lot of, in the scientific area, as you know, a lot of circulation. Uh, but in the case of Latin America, um, there's a language issue and there is also an issue of status because if um, for example, if you look at uh, universities in uh, Germany, um, they're defining strategic partners for the internationalization policy and always use USP is there. You know? And sometimes UNAM, and that's it. And if you would go to USP and you have to sell your university leadership, a collaboration with a uh, um, university in Bucharest, uh, they, of course, will take one, I don't know, in Germany, in Berlin, just to give an example, or in France. So my question is, is it sufficient to have the, those to build up ties, or we need also a strategy to know better? Thank you, Baba. Yeah, I think that you are correct, but that's a problem. This is a big challenge that we need to solve, uh, but uh, very complicated, very complex. I agree, but this should be done with the collaboration, in my opinion, of our governments. So uh, it's also need to have some diplomatic measures from the Latin American governments. We need to be more close to Central Europe, uh, but we need to convince our politicians in Latin America, 
So maybe this could be the solution. We, Latin Americans, uh, we academics, that we, if we agree that Central Europe is a better opportunity for us than Western Europe, and if we agree that we should focus on Central Europe, I think that we need to convince our diplomatics, our governors, uh, president, and uh, politicians that it's important to focus the relation on Central Europe. And also in the academic field, in, uh, I think that we need to try to establish relation with uh, Central Europe University. For example, I am a visiting professor in two Hungarian universities, Peix and Corvinus. Uh, I can assure you that they have a great interest in Latin America. So uh, <clears throat> they invite me every year to teach about Latin America about the economy, about the culture, uh, history of Latin America. They have a great interest, and not only interest, they know a lot. They know a lot. Uh, uh, I, have, uh, I became very impressed in some situations uh, when I take part of some PhD benches uh, about Latin America, about Mercosur, about uh, Colombia. Uh, Hungarians, they did their thesis about Latin American countries with a great knowledge. So they, they know a lot about us. They study a lot. They have a great interest. I think that we have to have the same here about in relation to, to Central Europe, but we don't have. So I think my impression is that we, Latin Americans, we are not so interested in Central Europe as they are in us. But this is something that we need to improve. Uh, but so I agree that it's a very complex uh, aspect, very complex problem to solve. But we need to have the collaboration of our government. We need to have a kind of a public policy that will define that Central Europe is uh, a, a target for, uh, for, for, for Brazil and for, and, uh, for Latin America. OK. I completely agree. Uh, there was a European project, you might remember that, um, that put special focus on what we call Eastern Europe, um, you know, because Central Europe uh, is, is, at least from a German point of view, is a little bit ambiguous. And that's also, I think, it's interesting um, because it's, historically it's, it's Central Europe, no? But we still call it differently. And there was a role of the Latin American Institute in, in Vienna to, to, make, to organize these networks. And it was quite impressive because there were a lot of similarities from his, as you uh, pointed. Um, out, but then um, uh, the situation after uh, became normalized in the European Union, and nobody took special focus on uh, um, how to bring Central Europe on board. Um, so I think that there is some something we have to rejoin because, in that point, there were a lot of meetings in the European Latin American Studies Association related uh, to the transition countries, how they have been called. Um, so I think uh, what we now have is a very fragmented landscape in, in Europe, despite the fact that many ambassadors of Latin American countries, in particular the smaller ones, uh, based in Berlin, um, they are also in charge of Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, etc., etc. I'm not talking of Brazil, but for example, the Central American countries. So they, there would be a role, but it's completely in, so invisibilized. So thank you very much. I think there is a, are you, in Spanish you would say una deuda pendiente, no? Uh, because for many reasons, it's, it's much better to compare than... Um, you are totally correct. It's a very complex problem. Uh, maybe one of the reasons why we are so fair so far 
uh, from Central Europe is because of the Cold War, that period of the Cold War, when we were forbidden to have relations with them. So it was difficult to start everything again during the 90s, no? And so even the diplomatic offices of Latin American countries are very recent, very new. Even tourism is weak. You know, few Latin Americans go to, to Central Europe, to Hungary, to Czechoslovakia. Uh, normally, Latin Americans prefer to go to France, Spain, UK, Germany. But this is something that I think that we need to stimulate, but we need to sit together with Central European countries and to discuss a common policy. Central Europe and Latin America discussing how to integrate themselves, not only in terms of trade, but in terms of tourism, in terms of coach, culture, uh, uh, university approximations, you know? So, but this is something that need to be done by both regions. So uh, I think that these t 10 countries, uh, they need to be together to discuss this, this kind of subject. And Paulo would like to talk or would like to respond during your talk? No? no? Just, Just a, a comment. A okay. comment. <laughs> if you please. Well, uh, uh, my congratulations. I think it was very interesting the way you have compared some very interesting aspects. And of course, some of them you, you didn't think about. But when we speak about uh, academic cooperation, sometimes you have not so much difficulties. But uh, when we speak about trade, we need to seek for complementarities. And sometimes when we consider, for example, Mexico and Brazil, uh, I think we have so many uh, uh, points, common points, and perhaps these uh, complementarities will not be so visible. How do you think about this? Yeah, you are correct. Uh, Mexico and, uh, and Brazil, especially Mexico, because <coughs> unfortunately Brazil faced a big deindustrialization process, no? So we Brazilians, we lost our industrial capacity with some exceptions like Embraer. But Mexico is a very important country in terms of manufacture and industrial capacity. But uh, they, uh, I think that we, we even consider this, uh, there are many complementarities because the, the European, these Central European countries, they are very strong in some aspects, especially, for example, make precision machines, especially Hungary and Czechoslovakia, they have a very powerful sector of machines, industrial machines, uh, uh, precision industrial machines, electrical machines, and they have also some pharmaceuticals industry, uh, in Slovakia, in Hungary. So I think that there are some sectors where they are very competent and we are not. But uh, sure, there will be some sectors where they are competent and we are too. No? But, uh, uh, well, this is normal in trade, in the world commerce, no? So you need to find uh, some focus, some niches, well, it, but I think that this is not an obstacle for us, okay? But I agree with you. There are some uh, common points, really. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have a question. Um, perhaps it's a little bit sensitive, but as you go off into Hungary uh, as a visiting professor, I wonder if uh, you have any ideas or any perceptions on potential limitations of academic partnerships that may arise because of the rise of nationalism in Eastern uh, Central Europe. Poland nowadays has a very nationalist government, so does uh, Hungary. Even the CU, the Central European University, um, would have its license cancelled. Uh, last time I heard that uh, there was a strong civil society movement. 
what is your take on that? Is the, does it pose a challenge for building further cooperation between Latin American and Central European universities? Well, uh, you are correct, Vinicius. And they, they now, especially these two countries, Poland and Hungary, they, they are under very populist government presidents, uh, prime ministers, and especially because they are parliamentarists. And in the case of Poland, it's a very interesting regime because the, the command is from the, the party. Uh, you know? It's very interesting. The, the, the most important person of Poland is the president of a, of a party. You know? Not the prime minister, neither the president, but the president of the party. But they are very populist. And, uh, but this doesn't mean that they would avoid us. My impression is that their problem is against the Muslims' country, especially the Muslims. They are afraid of the migration. The problem is what they are really afraid is uh, to have a lot of mi migrants uh, so that's their difference, especially Poland and Hungary, their difference with uh, the rest of the uh, European Union. But I think that they have nothing against Brazil and Argentina, and so I think that they will accept very well the, the relation with us. It won't be an issue. The, the problem of the, that university that you mentioned uh, I think that is something very, very specific, and it also is a political problem between Viktor Orban and uh, George Soros. So something very political, and uh, but uh, related to the populism of Viktor Orban. So, but I, I, I think that we can bet that uh, we, have, we can have very good relations with that countries of Central Europe. So, okay. so thank you very much. Uh, do you have any further questions? Um, by the way, we are going to have time for a debate in the end. Uh, uh, all the speakers will gather here, so feel welcome to ask anything you want. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, Professor Paulo Feldman. So, uh, now let's. Yeah. So, um, let's move on uh, to Dr. Paulo Sequeira from CNPK. So, please come here. He's going to talk about the potentials and challenges of EU select relations. So, somehow addresses the yeah the points that uh, professor feldman introduced so let's see which are the institutional challenges and incentives for building further cooperation thank you well uh, first of all uh, it's a pleasure to be here i'd like to thank uh, cecilia and professor martucci and also Willy for this uh, invitation it's a pleasure to discuss uh, about uh, eu select cooperation my talks will be on scientific dimension, and before I enter to discussion, I would like to show you some information about the mechanisms, the instruments that you have to uh, support this kind of cooperation. Please, uh, next one. Well, uh, uh, if you don't have this kind of tools, perhaps the cooperation would not be as we are nowadays. Uh, first of all, we have a senior officers meeting under the Joint Initiative on Research and Innovation. We call normally SOMGIRI in Portuguese. Uh, uh, established in the Madrid Summit 2010 and act as a regular by regional uh, dialogue on research and innovation to consolidate uh, CELAC EU cooperation and to update GIRI priorities through biennial action. This is very important because it's a kind of mechanism that uh, partners and countries from both sides have uh, opportunities to discuss and to decide about priorities, about mechanisms, and about uh, uh, expectations for the future. Another mechanism, this is a kind of a personal one. We have uh, national contact points, uh, persons that 
uh, are indicated to diffuse and prepare select researchers to participate in European initiatives. As Barbara has told, uh, uh, to cooperate with Europe is very, very complex because they have so many roles and the complexity, the, the bureaucracy, it's not so easy. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, contribution, it's very important to uh, approximate the partners. Uh, another one is the link offices, something like uh, national contact points, but as a, 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 a representative of an institution to do this kind of work and to promote uh, opportunities for uh, research and development and capacity building. Uh, another mechanism, it's a, a, a new one from the European Union, is the service facilities programs. It's a kind of add to support dialogue and policy plans in uh, research and development. Another one is air access. Uh, we have known about uh, science without borders. So Brazil has a great effort to send people abroad. And uh, in this kind, this, this uh, mechanism uh, help people, help students, researchers in uh, uh, logistics and free information for events and also for research funding, research careers and collaboration opportunities. Next. Another aspect that is very important, Barbara has also uh, uh, mentioned, is some uh, EULAC projects to support international cooperation. One of them is AUQUINET. AUQUINET is a Latin American, Caribbean, and European Union network on research and innovation. Uh, it's a kind of policy dialogue. It's created to facilitate the dialogue between uh, uh, EU and CELAC countries. Uh, in this kind of project, to have 12 partners, 10 from Latin America, and in Caribbean, we did not do to, to <laughs> we have to mention, no? uh, and also uh, eight partners from Europe and EU member states and associated members. The objectives of, uh, uh, is, uh, of the uh, Alcuinet is to uh, give more information about uh, uh, science and technology systems, uh, try to uh, inform about uh, uh, policy implementation, and also uh, strengthening and expanding the network for NCP in Latin American and Caribbean. Okay, next. The activities uh, is uh, to prepare document, documents, action plans, and recommendations for the song. It means uh, uh, we can say that Alquinet acts as a secretary for uh, 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 song meeting, okay? Uh, so uh, we have uh, observatories, uh, reports, and uh, NCP and like alumni networks. Uh, also, they try to connect joint activities to integrate and give information to partners in order to help in this meeting. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, they are they have close uh, linkage with another projects as ERANET that I will speak about in the next uh, slide. Brazil has actively participated in these projects. Uh, it means that, uh, of course, Brazil has, has its own policy in science and technology, but we are together with Latin, America, Latin, America, Latin American countries. And we need to converge our point of views and our interests with these countries. Of course, we are sometimes very different in terms of economics, policies, uh, okay? But we need to converge in something. And so we are there in order to define priorities together. Uh, the final consortium me meeting uh, held in Buenos Aires on November 14, uh, 2017. Uh, another project is ERANETLAC. It's quite the same network, but in this case, is for research activities. The main difference is uh, how we net prepare information, try to uh, do some recommendations to the uh, some meeting. And uh, um, ERANETLAC have concrete activities. For example, they launch so many calls, and we can say that 
these are actives that concrete actives already uh, do it, uh, did. Uh, we have in this case 17 partners from from uh, Eustela, uh, 16 from Eustelac partners countries. The objective is supporting the implementation of jury, is training and expanding by the bi-regional and partnership in science, technology, and innovation. Planning and implementing concrete activities. This is the main point. In this case, we have together launched calls on science and technology and uh, establishing also an innovative and sustainable framework for future actions. Next. Well, just to inform you, we have uh, some activities of uh, Euronet Lab uh, project, uh, mutual opening and coordination of existing programs, implementation of three joint calls, and the third one was recently launched. This uh, was in November, I think last week. Um, we have also a form to consult process for funding and innovation agencies to participate in joint funding calls. It means that with this kind of project, we have established a kind of platform of consultation and information in order to see how uh, countries can contribute or participate in some calls. Of course, uh, knowing how can they can contribute, in what kind of uh, way they use to contribute, okay? And they have already create created uh, an EUCELAC information on communication platform to provide a framework and a strategic base for the future. This is also very important because we have information, we can see and see the, the participation of countries and they can communicate. We have also a kind of uh, interaction with financing agencies from EUCELAC countries. Uh, the project will be closed in December. Why I, I, I remarked that they are finishing? Because they are very important. And so we need to reflect about how to go on with this cooperation without this kind of project. Please go on. Uh, we have some remarks to our net calls. It's about the, the, the calls that I have mentioned. The first one was in 2014. Uh, the project selects were on bioeconomy, biodiversity, climate change, energy, health, and ICT, uh, information and communication technologies. Uh, CNPK has allocated 2 million uh, uh, reais. It's about uh, 900,000 euros. And, uh, but we had a problem with this. This uh, call was uh, joined with our internal call. So we had a problem of schedule and the Brazilian participations did not uh, have success in approve their uh, projects. But in the second, we changed and we have success on it. The second call was launched in 2015, selected projects in the same areas and CNPQ has allocated 200,000 uh, uh, no, no, uh, euros for six projects on biorefinery, energy, health, and ICT. The third call was launched last week, uh, and St. PK will support projects on ICT, health, bioeconomic, and allocating about allocating until. Uh, 50,000 uh, euros by project. Uh, it's very important to remark that each part defines how much they will put in this kind of projects. And of course, it's very interesting because they will be allocated according to uh, their uh, national roles. So you don't need to pass country to send country abroad. We, they, uh, it's a kind of fund, you Latin American funding, that we can um, um, use according to our roles, so it's not so bureaucratic, okay? Uh, we have to uh, mention also 
that you have some achievements of the EU select countries in cooperation. We have already uh, progress in establishing common research area, defining priorities together for uh, research and development, and for research mobility and research infrastructures. This is a kind of um, pillars for the cooperation on science and technology with uh, Europe. Um, we have implemented, as I have told, uh, as I had told, some uh, joint calls under the Euronet, and there are others foreseen for select partners. It means that with this experience, Europe and uh, try to launch calls open to uh, Latin American countries and Caribbean. And uh, this kind of call, uh, they are invited to say what kind of support they have and the fields they, uh, they, they prefer. Um, establish of a network policy dialogue, as I have told. Creation of working groups on uh, research and innovation. We had uh, a infrastructure, uh, we have a kind of uh, uh, group in infrastructure. It's trying to discuss how we can integrate infrastructure, science and technology infrastructures uh, with uh, Latin American countries and European countries. Of course, it's not so easy to do because we have so many differences in these infrastructures for research. Um, and creation of interest groups in thematic areas. Next. Well, uh, we are speaking about uh, difficult and uh, challenges for this cooperation. So uh, we have some, we have identified so many uh, difficulties. One of them is asymmetry. Barbara has also uh, remarked very well because the countries are not the same. And we are speaking about only Latin American Caribbean. And if you go, if you go to European, we have sometimes more difference. So uh, in uh, some aspects, uh, economic development, cultural aspects, and also um, scientific infrastructure. Uh, we have a lack of planning in research policy for a proactive action. It means that sometimes we don't know how we want. And of course, European countries, they come more prepared. And so to negotiate sometimes is not so, so comfortable. Um, we have a limitation of research for international cooperation, okay? And, uh, and here, uh, uh, many countries, they don't need to put money. Barbara mentioned also this, but Sometimes you need to put some money to uh, decide better our interests. Uh, need for a research infra infrastructure in some select countries. Uh, when we speak about Brazil, Max, and some others, they have already a good infrastructure in science and technology. But some others, they don't have infrastructures. Perhaps they have in their, their universities, but in some in research institutions, they, don't, they are not well prepared as Brazil in some aspects, in some fields. Uh, limitation of the other one, need to reinforce capacity building. Some countries are not prepared. So try to uh, uh, conciliate interests from these different countries. It's not comfortable, it's not easy. Um, obligation, this is what Barbara also uh, remarked. Brazil, Mexico, and Barbados has ob have obligation of counterpart. It means that under the Horizon 2020 actions, uh, this can limit our efforts because you need to be more selective. And sometimes we are invited, but we, we don't have so much money to participate in all, all opportunities or activities. So these you have the conclusions. There, the, the other one, 
Before? No, no. Before? Antes? Ok. Next. So, uh, we I, I try to reflect about some conclusions, and these conclusions is, uh, of course, we had programs, progress in this kind of cooperation, and we have some achievements, and the importance of this cooperation, I think, stimulate new efforts, okay? Uh, we have mentioned Alquinet and also Eranet Lac, but we need to think about this because they are very important instruments to support this kind of cooperation. And how we can, uh, how we can, for the future, how we can do this kind of cooperation without this kind of support? We have reflected in the last meeting of uh, Alcuinet in Buenos Aires, perhaps people are more prepared to support this kind of activity for some months, but we will not be able to support for the future. So you need to reflect about this cooperation because you need to assume new responsibilities and commitments on this cooperation. Of course, additional efforts will be necessary to establish new means, tools, and financing mechanisms for cooperation. Another point is planning and monitoring. I need for proactive action on research and development with Europe, Europe, European Union. Next. Well, thank you. I am at your disposal for some discussions. I think we'll be next stop for discussion. Yes? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paulo Sequeira. And given that our next uh, topic um, step in the program is the round table among all presenters. I think it's better that you come here and let's start the discussion. Um, so, I don't know exactly how I would like to proceed. If you'd like, start in making questions to one another that can stimulate some debate among the audience. Yeah, so please. <laughs> I would like to ask Paulo. Well, first, congratulations. I like very much your presentation, and also yours, Barbara. Uh, congratulations for both. But let me ask Paulo something. In case of Brazil, uh, uh, the coordination of the efforts of uh, EU CILAC uh, is done by which department, which minister, you know? The main ministry is the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation, and now Communications. <laughs> because before it was not another name. Um, but CNPQ, as part of uh, this ministry, it's, uh, and participate in many European projects, are together with the ministry to propose to uh, uh, work on this kind of uh, not making a policy, but trying to develop some instruments and try to involve in some cooperation on this. And as a, a final partners, we have also our minutes of final affairs. So we work together. In the case of CNPQ, you have also some interaction with some minister, depending on the field, depending on the thematic. So we have uh, together some calls with um, health. We have... Uh, woman minister <laughs> or secretary and some other. 
So I think, uh, in general, we coordinate internal by the Ministry of Science and Technology, abroad together with the Ministry of Finance Affairs, and uh, uh, complementary with CNPQ. In the uh, international meetings, sometimes you are together. If not, CNPQ represents sometimes the Ministry of uh, uh, Science and Technology or means represent us. So I think in this case, we're a little bit integrated. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And well, so th the focus in Brazil is science and technology. Is the same in the other countries of Latin America? So Argentina, Mexico, the coordination is done by the science and technology minister? Uh, in the case of Argentina, we had. In some others, we have that uh, institutions that you call national um, science and technology institutions. Organismos Nacionales de Ciencia y Tecnología. To Barbara in Spanish, uh, it means that CONACIT, CONICET, uh, son los, uh, they are uh, national organisms, and sometimes when then they don't have a kind of minutes of science and technology, they act as a, a partner in this uh, uh, cooperation. Um, yeah, thank you very much, and um, um, if, if you allow me, I would like to ask um, not only one, but a few questions. Um, f first of all, um, scientific knowledge needs internationalization. It's a, f format and a form and practice of knowledge that travels, so that is at the basis of our uh, officio, no? Um, at the same time, we are depending on public funds and you have to decide. So um, from a strategic point of view, um, if you take a country as Germany, um, by in the internationalization strategy, and as you know, in the same way as Brazil, we have not only one actor, but several ones, uh, binational relations are still um, somehow priority. I put it now in simple words. Um, of course, we have the European level, and as one of the main donors, um, there is also an interest in positioning Germany-based Germany researchers in the EU calls. But we also have a strategy in the middle that means co coordinated calls between several European agencies. Normally, these are the strongest ones. Uh, for example, NVO of Netherlands or Agence France and then the ministry, etc. The rationale of that being that you allow up and down grade, no? uh, which taking into account the diversity of science, it's important because you have some areas of science that can travel faster and easier and others, I'm a social scientist, if you look at humanities that are much more difficult. Now, if you look at Latin America, what you have, you have now the YIRI mechanism, which is, I think, great for the bioregional collaboration, but it's still quite weak. And it has to somehow um, handle the heterogeneity. Because um, in all this, co-financing is key in order to be able to negotiate. And you made the right point that then we need to negotiate better and in order to negotiate better, you need money, but you need also strategic alliances. So if you look at the jury sum mechanism, it's somehow a consensus between a lot of heterogeneity, and it's more or less maximizing the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> then you have bilateral relations, and as you know with well, uh, sorry that I'm mentioning Germany. It's not because of Germany. It's because simply it's, it, I know that a little bit better with regard to Brazil. You have these joint calls. But you do not have mechanism where several Latin American funding agencies really work in a continuous way together. And this is a question I always have. Why this is not happening? Why it is so difficult? If you would go to Minsid or uh, take Fonacid or the 
You have relations, but you, don't, you do not have articulation of funding mechanism. If you would do so, the strong countries in Latin America could negotiate much better because now what you have is European Union negotiating with Brazil, and this is, of course, an unequal footing. Related to that, if you look at the numbers, um, and you can take all of the four strong, traditionally strong countries in the area of research in Latin America and take the new strategic ones like Colombia and Peru, you have a lot of investment in um, collaboration with the global north and some countries of the global north. But you have much less money spent in um, connecting Latin America. Um, so my question again would be why this is so difficult. Because in Europe we are very much accustomed to this type of articulation. Um, and uh, this would make it easier to put, for example, center, Central Europe into on the scene. Yeah. yeah let, me add, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, let me only add a small point here to what Barbara mentioned. Is there any coordination of Latin American countries? I, I will try to, uh, to answer by part, <laughs> because uh, we are speaking now about um, multilateral cooperation, okay? But we had a strong bilateral cooperation. If you are speaking about CENTIQ, CENTIQ has uh, agreements with all Latin American countries. So you have with CONACYD, CONCET, and we try to use these to launch Coordinate calls, I, not the coordinate call from Europe, yeah. Yeah, but coordinate in the, term that, in the term that we try to use these agreements to do some specific activities with these countries. Uh, frontiers countries are usually uh, our uh, uh, priorities. And Latin, Latin America is one of our priorities. So we had, for example, we have launched um, um, we have a kind of, we call this uh, bilateral call. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, today, nowadays, is not, uh, we have a kind of uh, uh, bad get uh, lower than before, and, uh, but we use, uh, you usually launch calls together with some countries. So, uh, depending on we had a specific one with Argentina or together with Colombia, uh, Mexico. Uh, in general, many countries, depending on how much money they can put because they have, they have also problems to put money. But we try to integrate all these countries in a call. We decide with each country the, pri the priorities, negotiating with them their priorities, and conci conciliate them with our priorities. We have some special programs together with this. For example, we had until 2010, and we are trying to uh, reactivate this, a kind of problem that's, that you call PROSU. Mm -hmm. PROSU, is, it was a kind of era net lack for South region. You, we're, we, we were trying to, uh, together, had a kind of Latin America fund, but they never put money. So the Ministry of Science and Technology and St. PQ put our money and we we'll do together. In this case of uh, uh, program, we had research, we have um, or, uh, organization of events, mm -hmm. okay, and also some travels contact. So people go, make, uh, did their first contact, and after that, we try to develop together a project. And we are trying to continue this, but at this moment, but we, we try to do. And of course, when you had, uh, from two, two years, we, we have a kind of uh, commission together with them. And you use uh, the, the multilateral cooperation in order to know better and to inform better about how to integrate our countries. And you had uh, mentioned, uh, uh, it was clear, sometimes we need more uh, articulation mm -hmm. in Latin America. If you had more articulated, perhaps 
we could be more successful in this kind of uh, cooperation. But we have some mechanism. Of course, it's not so strong, but we had it. And uh, uh, using this kind of programs as ERANET and also um, Alquinet and some others, we try together to get more information about uh, science development. For example, today, uh, uh, nowadays, we are together in an uh, interest group on infrastructures. So we are mapping infrastructures in Brazil. Brazil has already mapped it, but some countries not. We suggest a kind of questionnaire to the American countries, uh, American, uh, South American, Caribbean countries. We are trying to have a meeting to this. And the problem is sometimes they don't have, they don't have mapped their uh, infrastructures. In some countries, uh, infrastructures are so different. In the case of Brazil, we have about uh, 26 or 27 institutes of research, very strong. CBPF, INPA, Mathematica, INPA, um, Amazonia. For, so they are strong, they have mechanisms, they are instruments. And we need to establish, for example, a methodology for this and try to see what kind of infrastructure we are speaking about. Because when we speak with the European Union, they have mapped and they, and they say, oh, it's a very complex definition. But they know well what, but we need to know because uh, we can integrate uh, university infrastructure and we can integrate mm, high level in more power infrastructures for LNCCs, uh, energy, and do you understand? And, but I think uh, there is a lack of articulation. We had problems, but, but you have some initiatives in order to uh, minimize these kind of problems also. I don't know if I... Yeah, it, because this is typical from Latin America. Uh, we are not integrated among ourselves. I take part of a consortium with the uh, Chinese university, FUDAM. FUDAM and 12 Latin American universities from Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. Six countries, two universities of each country, and the Chinese. Well, which is the big issue of our consortium? Because each Latin American university speaks a different language from the other, have different objectives. And uh, so this, <coughs> uh, uh, the last meeting that we had two weeks ago in Colombia, all of us Latin Americans, we mentioned to the Chinese people that their most important uh, merit, the po most important positive aspect was that they were able to join us because uh, on the beginning we were very totally disarticulated. This is a cultural problem of Latin America. We don't integrate among ourselves. Difficult to, is to explain. Maybe the language is similar, Portuguese and Spanish, but <laughs> should not be a problem. But uh, I don't know, we don't consider ourselves as Latin Americans. If you, if you ask a Colombian or a Peruvian, Argentine, are you a Latin American? No, no, no. We are Brazilians. Yeah, yeah, and Brazil, we are Brazilians. So. Maybe there's a strange issue because you have in the European Union 23 languages and uh, there is an experience of difference. You would never expect uh, sameness in that, in that sense. Um, so I live in Berlin and the nearest largest city is Varsovia. So you would never expect that a uh, university would, of Warsaw would work the same as in a university in Berlin. So I think this is maybe some issue that there is an experience of difference um, and of course, um, Argentinians are not the same as Colombians. We know all that. But uh, 
There is also, I think, um, and maybe that's the strength of the European Union, that it's a non-negotiable, that you, you will never make any career, not in academia, but in at a private uh, company or, um, I don't know, in the ministry, if you would not have been in another European country. It basically does not exist. Uh, that you have not been in another, some time of your career biography, school, um, university, etc. And I think uh, this is something that is not the same in Latin America, that not many incentives. Of course, uh, everybody would expect you to do a PhD if you're a good student outside of Latin America, but not um, within Latin America. And Brazil played that role for a long time. And now because of the crisis, we know the situation, it cannot play this role because Brazil has been key for mobility, attracting um, students and uh, postdocs, etc. But still, you will not get more um, salary if you have that experience of internationalization but you would do so in, in most of the European countries. So I think uh, there's something also to, to, to tell people um, that this is, I don't know how to say, that this is very Im Im important and we are starting to do so. If you look at Mercosur, I hope really that we will sign the contract with the agreement, European Union, Mercosur. This would make things much easier. Um, so it's not only cultural, it's maybe also a political decision of leadership of universities to say you have to internationalize, and that is not only to go to Europe, to the US. I think that it's not only political, it's also cultural, but uh, I think that could, especially cultural, because look, we, uh, we were always, we, we always gave preference to have relation with United States mm -hmm. or Western Europe or Japan, but we, we never prioritize the other countries in South America. And I think that Mexico is one of the responsible because for Mexico, they don't have any interest in, in South America. For them, the relation should be with the United States. And 80% 80 per, 80 of their exportations are to the U.S. and the same with the importation. So the trade, Mexico trade is totally dedicated to U.S. Mm -hmm. They never pay attention to us. Maybe this is one of the responsible for our lack of integration because Mexico would be very important for us. I hope that with the issue with Donald Trump, they will pay more attention to us. So the wall, the wall will be a good thing for South America. If Trump really builds the wall, maybe could be something good for us. Because Mexico will need to look for us. Yeah, yeah. But so we have some, in, we have a really very few levels of integration in South America, but we practically, we don't have nothing with Mexico, and this is a big issue. I would like to comment uh, regarding uh, capacity building. We have another program, I did, I did mention it. We call it uh, PEC, PG. In English, it's something like graduate program for scholarships to uh, developing country. Developing country, we can say all countries, including Latin America, a, uh, um, some other countries in Africa and uh, Western. Uh, but uh, we need only to have a cultural agreement or a scientific agreement. They can participate of this. In this kind of program, our universities, they give us the place for the, the foreign people to come to Brazil, and CNPQ will finance the scholarship. It's a very, very useful program for, for example, in Latin America, Colombia, Peru, Cuba. All of them, they come, and they are coming not for the uh, University of Goiás only. They come to USP, they come to University of Rio de Janeiro, and uh, I think 
Colombia, for example, Peru, they use this as a platform to uh, build better capacity in some fields, okay? This kind of problem, this is another problem. This kind of problem is to man, to hands. It means I can offer, you can offer also to Brazilians. And so we have a little problem. Brazilian people are more interested to go, but many countries, they didn't offer scholarship for us. The only one that offer is Mexico, uh, about five. Or when we speak about Peru, they say, oh, but our scholarship, our, 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 our universe, our private universe, you can put it, but in Brazil, private universe offer also, Catholic universe, and we ha you say them, if you are a private one, you need to firm a kind of commitment that we will not uh, uh, ask them to pay their, their, their tuition. And so they, they do, because for CAPS, it's very important that universe can receive people abroad. So it's a kind of internationalization, and we use this. It's a very interesting, interesting problem. We have another one, and we will try to use this to integrate Europe also. Today, it's only for Latin American developing countries. It's, uh, we call it PECG. PECG is undergraduate program. This is a program from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They offer, uh, they will not offer uh, scholarships, but they offer place to students uh, from Latin America and other developing countries to come to Brazil and to study in our universe. It's a very, but in this case, uh, I think it's a little bit complex because undergraduate uh, people are young, sometimes they, you know, and uh, uh, the, the, the whole, the whole uh, uh, place are not covered. So we are trying to uh, discuss with European Union to come open this kind of program also to European Union in order to do a kind of internationalization, uh, asking people to come to Brazil, to know better our culture, our institutions, because uh, St. PQ is a is a, has a tradition to send people abroad. We have a kind of program, post, post, uh, graduate program. Not only, si only science without borders. We had done this so many years ago, and we are going on on this. So sometimes the problem is preference. Uh, they perhaps don't know well our universes. Some of them are very strong. This is one of them. And, uh, but uh, we need to try to offer better to diffuse. We don't know more about our uh, neighbors. Sometimes we know better about Europe, United States, but we don't know our neighbor, what they need, how we can uh, uh, try to uh, 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 amenize this asymmetric uh, relation, okay? I would like only to tell you that uh, uh, my congratulation, it was a very interesting also because I knew about this program, but the way we are working is very interesting. I had, speak, I had spoken up with uh, Marcus, but he never told me, well, what is this kind of fraud? But it's very interesting. And so I think we can together try to uh, uh, um, interact in order to uh, use better the information from the other projects, okay? Yeah, I think for the power asymmetry, of course, articulating funds is key. And if you look at Peru and you have Concitec and they are, do not have enough money or even called Ciencias in Colombia. Um, of course, um, uh, to uh, um, know the other is also basic because if you don't know, you don't know how to connect, etc. You need to know the landscape. And it's like the maps we are having of the world. We are still focusing on very traditional views on the landscape for scientific and academic collaboration. And uh, But one key issue also 
in, the, in taking care of the asymmetric configuration is how to negotiate the agenda. This is not only for scientific collaboration, it's also for others. So in that sense, um, I, I would really like to know what your strategy is, because if you look at the European Union or if you look at more bilateral collaboration, um, you have priorities being set, and these priorities are quite the same in many countries of the world, but those who are setting those priorities are only few. Um, if you look at bioeconomy, for example, if you look at environmental governance, um, this means in the European context something quite different than in the Latin American context. So, so my, my question also would be, um, and in that sense also the collaboration between Mexico and Brazil could be key. Uh, because there are joint experiences uh, you could put on the agenda. So my question would be, how do you look at that? Uh, how, how are these, um, the, 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 you, talk, you mentioned strategic topics, how are the, these topics negotiated and what are the challenges there? Uh, uh, speaking about uh, European Union, I think they have about uh, 16 priority areas. Under these 16, we have to decide if some of them is uh, in interesting for us or not. Um, we have two ways. We, have, we can use, uh, speaking in multilateral cooperation, we can also speak about bilateral cooperation, because sometimes <laughs> quite different one from the other. Um, when we are very, very interested in cooperating with Europe, we put money and we go together from the beginning to the end. So we had, for example, uh, five coordinated calls with Europe, and Brazil give 50 percent to this. So, for for example, they call us uh, some years ago, and they say we would like to cooperate in biofuels, sixth gen uh, third generation. For us, biofuels was not very interesting because we had Proalco, we have some others, no? And you, ha you say, we have said, okay, it's interesting. Uh, and the, I will put uh, 10,000 million euros, they said. Oh. First, it's, to us, it's a little bit difficult to have this money as soon as they, they, they need it. So we said, okay, but we would like to cooperate on ICT because we need to develop some aspect of software and not only hardware and so that. In some way, you are very strong. So we can go with you with in, the, in um, biofuels only if we can put one or two areas more. Yeah. And advantage. so uh, we decided, yeah. we, we, we did this call, and, but we did also, we are in the fourth call on ICT. Mm -hmm. we, and they agreed to do one of them in health, but we had problem with our Minister of Health at this time, and we are waiting for this. But in this uh, kind of quite uh, bilateral Brazil European Union, we can put money, you can try. And it was very interesting because it was a kind of learning by doing experience. As you told, it's very complex. And when St. PQ was there, I, oh my God, why I came here with this? It's very problematic. And they told, ah, we will not be successful in evaluate. No, any problem. We evaluate at the end of the week, all will be evaluated. And after that, they congratulations. We have done a very good work because we, we learn also. And we try to conciliate difference. And today we have the fourth one, uh, fifth, because one in biofuels and four in um, ICT. And we are intending to do something in um, health. When we are under a multilateral cooperation, we can choose all the fields that they say, but in subfields, 
in some areas you can decide, okay, it's health, but we need to speak, in, uh, we need to, to cooperate in uh, infectious disease, it's more important than cancer or, so we are in Aeronet Lac, Brazil decide what, where we will put money. Uh, sometimes infectious disease, sometimes uh, negli, negli, negligenciadas, uh, <laughs> disease, no? Ne neglected disease. And uh, some others. Uh, it means that we can, as you told, we can do a good negotiation, but we need to be more prepared to go. If you are only receptive, it's not, it's not a proactive action. And Yes, because uh, under uh, under this process, under under this process, you have so many meetings, and this meeting, and sometimes we have a kind of consult consultation by email. What area would you to? Well, oh, Paulo, Chile, for example. Paulo, we are together with you in this because it's very important. Okay, any problem? We can finance together this. And so it was with DLR. Is uh, DLR is the coordinator of Aeronet Lac. And so they say, oh, Paulo, okay, okay, we'll put this uh, Chile and uh, So you can also uh, take profit of this meeting in order to discuss better. It's a good opportunity to be, to, to be together. And of course, you are together and say, oh, well, and, but the problem is we don't know so much our neighbor. Let me, ask, uh, let me uh, try to do a, a Sorry, I don't know if you want to. Oh, no, I mean. can also keep the conversation, open the conversation yeah. during the coffee. Let me try to do a suggestion, but uh, let me emphasize before that I have a very low level knowledge about EU CLAC. So maybe I will suggest something that is already happening, so excuse me. But I think that maybe in, for the sake of the success it would be important to involve universities in all of these countries. So Latin American universities and also European universities, uh, especially because we are talking about science and technology. So I'm, I don't know if I'm wrong or not, but are the universities involved? Yes. For CMPQ, it's not so difficult because we have committees. These committees, evaluation committees at CMPQ, they say, oh, you need to go on on this field in Brazil. And uh, sometimes I think I'm not so sure about, but in some countries, for example, uh, in Argentina in this meeting, they invite so many researchers in order to know better how are the mechanisms of Europe uh, what field they, and try to uh, uh, inform them about how to uh, present uh, a proposal, okay? So, uh, and Colombia are doing a very good work because they are trying to uh, push, well, the, the, their science and technology development. They are better organized, Peru also. And I think they have a kind of mechanism to consult uh, uh, universities. Uh, Universities, researchers in general, okay? In Brazil, when uh, by CNPq and by the Ministry of Science and Technology, of course, we need a planning. There are so many years that we don't have a planning annual, biannual, uh, we don't have planning. So this is a problem in Brazil. Also. But as CNPq are very integrated with researchers in some universities, we sometimes have a kind of uh, information and level of interest in some aspects. And we try to go uh, uh, in our negotiations thinking about this. Oh, in this we need these universities. And so, and sometimes uh, they say to us in some projects that they, they need to reinforce some fields. So I think we have a good connection. Perhaps not at the level that you would like to but uh, some universities in Brazil are very uh, strong and they can influence uh, the government. Yeah?
Yes and no. If you would ask somebody, and I have to explain it the whole time, what the hell CELAC is, nobody knows, you know? Uh, so um, I would say yes and no. If you go to the Cumbres, the summits, which are after the Gen Assembly of United Nations, the largest meeting of uh, leadership of countries, um, you have a mechanism to s which is called the Cumbre Académica or Cumbre, I'm not sure whether this is now the right, so um, I apologize for this, but it's like a mechanism to get an input into the process of the summits uh, from the scientific communities. Um, but this is not in the sense as it would work in the European Union context, but it's more an architecture that is institutionalized by processes, representation, etc. It's a little bit more ad hoc. And that has advantages and dis disadvantages. And it, there are no financial means to uh, organize this. Um, so you could go via representation of universities and then the funding agencies, etc. And you have all this in the context of European Union with the academies of sciences and the non-university research institution, but you do not have that for Latin America and the Caribbean. So I think um, there is an issue. Um, you have, have it in base, in, at least from the Estatutos in Mercosur, and I'm insisting on Mercosur because it could really uh, have a role model in the in that context, but we have to work on that. <laughs> um, and I think um, it's not sufficient to bring in the research communities or the funding agencies. You have to bring in the university administration because for them, and I'm now talking about more European universities, and it's the point I made also with regard to cooperation from Latin American universities with Central Europe, it's a decision they're making whether they want to take the risk or not, whether they want to look at that type of multilateral collaboration as a learning experience or as an opportunity to get some funds, um, and uh, whether they are willing to put in what I call risk capital. Because these things, are, as they are learning processes, um, as Alexander von Humboldt always said, uh, there is the um, great heuristic importance of the failure. So what we need is, if, if, if you want to take in other type of collaborations uh, that are not established as being the tick-off type of collaboration, but nobody's uncontested ones. If you want to bring in new type of collaborations, uh, countries, type of universities, formats, etc., uh, we have to admit that failure is important because we would not learn. But that is difficult in moments of fund, funding re reduction of funds. If you look at the European context, and I'm in several boards of um, funding agencies in Europe related to Latin America and the Caribbean, they're not even talking about the Caribbean, they're talking about Latin America. But they're all reducing funds. Research Council Norway with the Latin American program, if you look at Spain, if you look at Denmark, if you look at the Netherlands, non-European collaboration with non-European countries. And it's all focusing China now, uh, as we know. Um, and it's very difficult to convince somebody to go contra corriente, no? To say no. Um, as you said, I like very much your point because um, you need somebody saying, okay, Czech Republic and Hungary even in spite of the political discussions in Hungary that are strong. But because it's the same with the Brexit, if we now step away from UK, we are missing momentum. We have to say, no, 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 we have to collaborate now with your UK uh, for, for strategic reasons. There always have been the connecting bridge to the US from a continental European perspective. But it's difficult in times of, well, whom I'm telling. <laughs> we have a lot of money for international collaboration. In Germany, we don't have positions. That makes it also quite difficult. We have the highest percentage in the world of non-permanent positions in the scientific public. You know, 74% are only on temporary contracts. 
So that makes that it's also difficulty. In spite of having so much so much funds, you also need insti to institutionalize the collaboration. If it's only on a project base, what will happen with our consortium after the pro project finishes? It's 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 really it's difficult to to give continuity. So. Um, maybe we have to include in the capacity building also university administrations so that they see a positive side on that and not only a bureaucratic nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because from the perception, and I think the Alconet is a good example, if you look from the outside, so many people told me, oh, they're meeting again, this is Turismo Academico, they're just traveling around. But it's so important to have that type of mechanism. And you only notice that how important they are if they're not there. Because there are some steps in articulation that would yeah. not have happened without Alconet. But if you look from the outside, you think <laughs> we are not really. Uh, so so, so I'm, I think we need to know more about also the work of the funding agencies. This is why I asked you so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah, so uh, I have a question, and just before we finish, we are running out of time, unless some of you have a question. No? No? Uh, you're talking a lot about China. Uh, so China came about in several times during your presentation, your debate, and I think Barbara mentioned at the beginning that there is this Atlantic Triangle uh, United States, Europe, and Latin America. To what extent China disrupts this triangle under an academic perspective? Or can we bring China to enhance our partnerships with universities in the region, among Latin American universities, and eventually to rebuild those ties with Europe and uh, eventually the United States? Well, I think that China is very aggressive in terms of uh, the approximation with uh, Latin America academia. Uh, well, you know that they are the most important partner in terms of trade, you know? So 25% of the Brazilian exportation this year goes to China. Uh, they probably this year they will be the most important investor foreign direct investment in Brazil. China is the, the first, will be the first. So, and now they are trying to be near the universities. They are very aggressive. They are giving a lot of scholarships for us, which is incredible, in, important for us because we don't have money now. We are. We we are very short of money in Brazil. You are responsible for this. Uh, you, Fapespi, and Caspi, yeah. But the fact is that the fact is that they are taking our students to to China to doing their PhD thesis there. It's a very interesting model. So uh, maybe you can use the same model in uh, CELAC uh, U. Uh, so they choose students that are doing their PhD in subjects related to China and Latin America. So the, uh, you, the team, the subject should be something interesting to China and Latin America. <coughs> should be a PhD student. So, and should be a research. So, research, PhD, subject, China and Latin America. Well, if you have a student with this condition, they will pay a scholarship for this student to go to China to finish their, uh, their research, their PhD. So he will stay in China three to six months we have a new coordinator there. So the, uh, all the students, they have a coordinator in the Latin American country, and also uh, uh, not a coordinator. The name is uh, a mentor or supervisor. Yeah, a supervisor, advisor uh, here and in China. And uh, it works. Uh, so I think that it's a very interesting model. And uh, we are on the beginning, but it's starting to work. Uh, 
have a kind of dual degree um, or they are just doing their coursework or research in Chinese universities or do they get a dual degree that is granted by both no, the Chinese and the Latin no, American universities? We university? intend to do in the future, <coughs> but we don't have yet. Uh, but it's uh, something that we are considering for the future, to have a dual degree. But look, this is only for doctoral students, PhD. But probably they will have the dual degree. Uh, it's, it's being considered. We, at my, in my faculty here, uh, FAIR, we have dual degree with some universities in Europe, especially in France. But uh, with China, it's very probable. In the future, probably we will have. But so, uh, what I s uh, they are very aggressive. So, uh, I think that they have a great interest in Latin America, the Chinese. And uh, so, in my opinion, they are more aggressive than Europeans, for example. No, and they, because they are... Uh, putting a lot of money here, and uh, so uh, they, they, it's very important for us, it's very good for us, Latin American, because now we have a new, very strong uh, force, which, I, which are the Chinese. So they are a kind of a counterpower to US, USA, you know? We, we were always under the influence of the United States, and now we have a new power, which is China. So it's good for us. But uh, I think that Europe is behind of US and China, so, which is not uh, correct, because Europe, it's more important than China and US in terms of uh, trade, uh, of power of commerce, you know, if you if you look at the exportations of the European Union, uh, Europe is more more important. So it will be important to have more uh, 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 strong presence of Europe in Latin America. But maybe I'm wrong. But in my opinion, the strong presence that we have here are from China and from US. Europe is not so present yet. You asked about the triangle, and it would be the Pacific Atlantic <laughs> Triangle somehow. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, China, but um, if you would look at, uh, while in Latin America, uh, Chinese universities are capturing brains, to say it somehow, in order to build ties and networks. From European perspective, it's, it's different because uh, if you take a country as uh, Germany where, well, China is the most important trade partner of Germany, more important than European Union, um, you have universities, technical universities, where 30% of the students are from China. Um, so it's more that um, they are sending students to German university or with German financial uh, mobility programs, etc. Uh, but you have um, several uni uh, what would be an, an issue, a question, I think, for Latin America. You have several um, German Chinese universities. And the DFG, the German Research Council, is the European Research Council that for longest time now has been, it's more than 35 years in in China, in, in uh, Beijing. But um, still there is no triangulation. They're like separate worlds, I would say, somehow. And I think this is something, and, and I like this point, where Latin American strong universities could take advantage of, to, to tell, in the same way as your biofuel example, to tell the European partner, look, I have this um, offer from Fudan, which is a university in the Fudan in Shanghai. It's, it's very internationalized. I think it's the most internationalized university in the, U in the China, as far as I know, but I'm not an expert. Um, so tell them, okay, if you do not offer us something, here we have a strong partner. Because there's also this confident that Latin America always will be there. And we have to shake a little bit that confidence and say, no, 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 no. Maybe they will not longer come to knock on your door because they already have other offers that are 
much stronger. So I think it's interesting to 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 to, to, to use those. Um, um, did you use uh, those new partners? Um. Well, uh, um, I think, <laughs> sorry, uh, just a, a comment. <laughs> I, will. Uh, I think that um, uh, this kind of triangul triangularization, triangulation, triangulation uh, uh, is good, but it's not developed yet. Of course, China is seeking for partners and try to uh, um, reinforce the cooperation science and tech with uh, uh, some countries that they used to do this. So in the case of CNPq, we had uh, an agreement with the uh, Academy of Science with China, but it's not stagnated. And so we, we seek together with them another institution, we revise an agreement, we ha you signed an agreement. And of course, we can put in this kind of agreement scholarships at the graduate level, uh, researcher, uh, some meeting under the research, uh, the research project, and I think we can go better. Uh, our cooperation with China is uh, ancient. We have the cyber programs for satellite with ink direct involved with a uh, uh, national, our space agents also. And uh, we have a, a kind of a tradition of cooperation in some aspects, but I think we need to develop better this kind of cooperation. What I, I would tell is that uh, it's much more difficult for Europe, because in Europe you have many countries and you are a democracy, and so in China it's easy. You know, only one country, no democracy. It's very so the government defines almost everything. So sure, uh, it's easier for the Chinese. Uh, but uh, I think that this may be one of the explanations. But the fact is that Europe is not so close to us as China and U.S. So, do you have any questions? Um, we are right, uh, beyond our initial time. Uh, it's already 20 to 5. So, unless you'd like to add anything else, I'd like to thank you for your wonderful presentations and also to thank you the uh, attendants and uh, IP, uh, sorry, the IPTV uh, guests who are watching us online. So thank you very much, and let's continue the conversation upstairs with more coffee. Thank you.